I'm currently at the London School of Hygiene Tropical Medicine. My current post is um, funded by the Foundation for Sociology of Health and Illness. This talk's going to be a little bit different. Most of my slides are pictures, um, and I'm going to more or less, in traditional uh, anthropological style, tell you stories and use those stories to reflect on issues about policy and end-of-life care. She fidgeted in what appeared to be sleep. She wasn't quite restless, but she definitely wasn't peaceful. Her thin limbs just sort of curled and twisted under the very dated care home bedspread. I spoke gently to her to let her know I was there, but no noises besides an occasional scratch against the wall or the linen starch could be heard in the empty room. We were clearly alone, and it felt as if time had just slowed down the second I stood in there. I sat for a bit in the room's only chair at the end of her bed, making a few notes about what was going on and thinking about how Mabel had really wanted to see the spring flowers that would now be bursting under the sun. I didn't know it then, but that would be the last time I'd see her. She died four hours later. Before I had left the care home, I wrote a small message on a piece of torn off paper and left it by the bed to say that I had been there. And that had prompted her daughter-in-law to text me later that day to say, thank you for visiting and that Mabel had died. When I first started my research in English end-of-life care policy back in 2010, when I was at the University of Cambridge, the questions that really burned the most inside of me by looking at all these policy documents was, what the heck is choice in end-of-life care? And really, uh, how is it supposed to be done? So it's quite a big buzzword in all these policies. I'm sure a lot of you are aware. Um, so I set out to ethnographically sort of make sense of what choice was. I was examining policy and policy promoting events, observing clinical practice, um, and shadowing a lot of specialist nurses. I spent time visiting hospices and support groups. I also spent over a year with 10 people who, according to their diagnoses, and clinical um, appraisals of their conditions could have been in their last year of life. Essentially, these people were the very subjects of end-of-life care policy. I frequently interviewed them and hung out with them in their homes, accompanied them to doctor's appointments, visited them when they ended up in the hospital, hospice, or care home, and where possible, I met with their families and friends, interviewed their doctors, nurses, and care, ho uh, care home professionals. Now, surprisingly, out of those 10 people, the majority of them lived beyond the study period. Um, and actually, some of them are still alive today. Um, but today, I want to talk about two of them, Mabel and Norm. And they both died in the same county within England. They both had cancer. And they both were in their 80s at the time of their death. And I want to use the stories of their deaths um, to think about how their experiences may have been shaped in the light of end-of-life care policy. Now, by talking you through their stories, I want us to reflect on how policy may be influencing not just the clinical practice in place of where someone dies, although you'll hear that come up in the stories, but also how people think about death, not only their own death, but also the death of other people, and how the dying process is being managed. And when I'm talking about personal impact, I'm not just talking about patients or even their family members or informal carers, but also professionals who have sometimes come to quite subtly, and sometimes just through their actions, to see death in different ways because of the power of policy discourses. And I'm sure a lot of you are aware of what I mean by end-of-life care policy. So I started off with uh, the National End-of-Life Care Strategy, as it was released in 2008 by the Department of Health. But I just want to be clear of what I sort of see it as doing. Its ambitions were to extend and improve the care provided to dying people, to ensure that they all have sort of a good death, and within this, it was often stated, ideally in their place of choice, um, and that they were well supported by services. Now, this document, as we're all very much aware, sort of influenced the creation of other documents, uh, position statements, and, and training, both locally and nationally, on how these ambitions uh, could be achieved. And we, we're still seeing the creation of such documents all the time. A core of my thesis, then, is that the ways in which end of life and death are considered in these documents is that it becomes a process that can be anticipated, discussed, and managed with choice, particularly through advanced care planning. Being a key element of this 
in order to achieve a particular kind of outcome that what this kind of document considers a good death. Policy then is not just some sort of abstract concept that politicians in Whitehall and the Department of Health are doing, but it's actually some sort of active agent in healthcare, giving direction through its discourse, the language it uses, and the power it has, and in a way also that constant reproduction to shape the ways in which care and death is being delivered and evaluated. The noble ambitions of policy, however, may also have some unintended consequences as it's translated into people's everyday experiences. Now I'm going to rewind a little bit into Mabel's story and to start, I did a different place than the care home in which she died and then I'll weave in and out of Norm's story as well. So everything looks pale under hospital lights, at least that's what my field notes from that day read. And so did Mabel. She was quite frail under the clean nighty as she laid in the hospital bed. She hadn't been to the support <coughs> group lately and had heard from another couple who often gave her lifts there that she had been admitted to the hospital. And that's where I found her that evening. She smiled weakly and just held my hand as we talked. She told me about how she had met her late husband and what it was like growing up in India, what it was like being in the hospital now, and how she thought her garden was getting on with all the sun we had been having. She had given up asking her daily question of, when can I go home, as the answer was always, we need to do more tests. She was losing blood, she told me, and they weren't quite sure where it was going or where it was coming from. According to her, she had had bone cancer for a while now and lately felt weak and was frequently falling. Mabel didn't really care about the results of the tests and didn't appear too worried about what they might reveal, even though her arms were covered in bruises from all the pricking they had done. Although, she said quite softly, if she had hoped that if they find something, they might be able to fix it. Later in our conversation, I asked her again why she did all these tests, some of which had been repeated several times over the past few weeks with no clear outcome. She leaned a bit closer, still holding my hand, and said, to entertain the young doctors, my dear. <laughs> they just seem so keen. Before I could sit down in the living room, Norm very calmly drew out a blue, glossy, preferred priorities for care document from a drawer in the dining room. It was the first time I had actually seen one of these outside of a medical setting or on a nurse's visit. I knew the hospice where he went used the forms to determine preferred place of death and encouraged every patient to fill one in. As he opened it, I was surprised how succinct his answers were. To the first question, progressive liver cancer. To the second, stay at home unless deemed unadvisable, under which circumstances he'd go to the local hospital, or hospice, sorry. And there were no other preferences listed. And when the third question came around about where he actually wanted to be cared for, he had left that blank. He figured the previous answer surely should suffice. <coughs> he had told me that the hospice had reassured him that if he needed help, including a night nurse, that it would be supplied. Just to be sure, he looked around the hospice to see what that would be like and was surprised how few beds and rooms there were. That made him wonder, would they actually have space if he needed to come in? Then he started to go, I can't quite know why I don't want to go to the hospital. I sort of have a thing about going to the hospital. He then told me how he used to work there. He had made prosthetics back in the 80s. And he couldn't quite explain why he didn't want to go there. He just knew it wasn't for him. Before being prompted by the nurses at the hospice, to think about his preferences. Norm had just always assumed that as he got ill, he'd go to hospital. That was the pattern of illness. You get sick, you go to care. But now that he had this document, he knew it could be different. When the time came, he said, perhaps in a year or so, although looking at his intense jaundice, I figured it might be otherwise. He told me how filling out the form had actually made him think of his son's death. His son had died also from cancer. It was found relatively late because they had suspected it was a sport injury in his leg. His son's death was also quite unexpected. He had just returned home from being treated from chemo. Norm doesn't remember thinking about the importance of place of death when his son died, although he did die at home, and Norm now wanted to himself die at home. 
But thinking about his son's death and how he just died at home, Norm said dying at home is something that just seems to happen. The preferred priorities for care document, or PPC as a lot of us frequently refer to it as, was promoted within the National End of Life Care Strategy as a way of facilitating patient choice towards the end of life. Within it and through other documents like advanced directives, people are provided a space and a means to communicate what they prefer in terms of treatment and care and importantly for the PPC, where they want to be cared for, and as the hospice where Norm went, where they might want to die for, or die, where they might want to die. Now, Mabel never had a preferred priorities for care document, although talking to her, it's unclear if she would have agreed to eliminating any treatment options. She was quite willing to sort of go on with what her clinicians advised. She had made her wishes clear, though, about wanting to go home to see her garden. I suspect her Macmillan nurse had tried in the past and Mabel brushed the issue aside as not being something that worried her. As we continue to unravel her story, you may wonder what a difference a PPC would or could have made. Now Norm's preferred priority of care document was one of the first things we discussed as he knew, after Googling me, that I was interested in choice and end-of-life care. It was clear in our conversation how this document and its questions had structured his own ways of thinking about his care and death. It preempted the importance of place, ordering which spaces and institutions he'd prefer to be in without necessarily forcing him to articulate why. It also made him reevaluate his son's death. And although dying at home was something that Norm reflected could just happen, it was clear that Norm considered that for his own death, he didn't want to leave it to such fate. Instead, there was now a plan, and this plan was supported by the hospice. Now, within policy discourse, there's quite a strong tendency to link place of death, and particularly dying at home, with the concept of a good death. We often hear statistics like 70% of people want to die at home, and about 50% of people die in hospital. Now, neither Norm nor Mabel died in hospital. And there's an emphasis within policy to keep, 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 keep people out of hospital, if we can, or to discharge them if possible. And a lot of the policy promotion at the time of the study, and particularly locally where I was doing it, made it evident that this focus of choice and place of death were very important factors politically, and this sort of trickled down to the experiences of Norm and Mabel. Now, more tests eventually discovered where this missing blood was, and they could operate. Now, by the time Mabel, by this time, when they finally figured out what was going on, Mabel was having transfusions weekly, if not more regularly, to keep her stable. But then, bad news followed good, and her family was told there was nothing more they could do. It was as flat as that. The doctors at the larger hospital, where she'd have to go for the operation, had decided without meeting Mabel, that they weren't going to operate. So Mabel's question, when can I go home, resurfaced. And her son Paul wanted her to go home. He worked hard with the hospital's discharge planning team to get her there. But she'd have this occasional turn, as it was described, and bleed profusely. She wasn't medically fit, the nurses say, to be discharged. They then moved her to a side room in this hospital. Now, the only other time I had visited patients in the side room in this hospital was when the patients were deemed terminal by the nurses. But then, you know what? Mabel surprised us all, and she started sitting up, and she was looking much spunkier than she had for months. The nurses decided then another patient was worse off, so Mabel was transferred back onto the bay. Still wasn't clear, though, when Mabel might get to go home. At that time, a bank holiday followed school holidays, followed another bank holiday, and it seemed that each time I spoke to Paul, the story was, they hope to let her out today, but we're still trying to find care. It turns out they could supply her with care during the day, but not find any night sitters. Now, remember, I conducted my study within sort of a county, so uh, Mabel and Norm lived about 30 minutes away from each other. It just so happens that Mabel lived in the town without a hospice. Um, and the hospice didn't quite cover that range at that time. So the alternative to being in the hospital was to go to a local care home where there happened to be a bed free. 
So day after day, we sort of all waited. And, and Paul called and restarted the search for night care, and even at this point, daycare, to reconfirm that it would be needed. And Mabel wanted to see her garden, and she said, even if only for three days, and that she'd be willing to go back into the hospital if needed. She was dressed and ready to go home every day for over a week. Now, without securing a night nurse, and because Paul and his wife felt unable to support Mabel at night should she take one of these dramatic spells, as they phrased it, Mabel was eventually discharged from the hospital into a local care home where I found her that day. Now, it was told to us that this was going to be a temporary residence as they continued the search for suitable care. Now, according to Paul, Mabel's son, supposedly the first time Mabel realized that she was going to be in the care home was when she arrived there. And however, this very calm and compliant woman, remember, who was willing to go on with all these tests, became very angry and furious in, in her wheelchair. She started cursing at him and the care home assistants. On the first day, she was just spewing ang anger at these people. The second day, she refused to join anyone for mealtimes. And the third day was the day that I saw her. When I spoke to Paul after Mabel's funeral, he was quite angry with himself with how it all ended. He didn't quite expect her to die so soon, because remember, she sat up and was spunkier. And he thought they still had months and was making arrangements to adapt her home. All this equipment had arrived, and, had, and now it had to be returned unused. And actually, returning the equipment took longer than it had done to get it in place. And he's quite disappointed with himself when I spoke to him that he never managed to take his mother to see her garden, which was so important to her. <coughs> he said if he'd realized that it would be so short that that time would happen so quickly, maybe he could have spent a few nights at home with her and take that risk of one of those dramatic spells. As for the care home, he said they didn't quite seem too concerned. He felt that it was what they did. It was a place where people like her went. To them, it was some sort of everyday occurrence. But he felt that for individual relations, as he phrased it, like me, it is different and somehow selfish, and she is our mum. I also managed to talk to the discharge planning team to sort of get their version of what happened. Now, I say team. It actually ended up being one person because there was an unfilled role and there was annual leave, which meant other people were often not in the office at this time. Now, she felt personally devastated by this outcome, and she saw Mabel's case as a failure, and those are sort of her words that she was using to describe it. She repeated the importance, practically, practically the sort of policy discourse embodied of sort of how vital it is to get people home before they die and to respect their last wishes. Now, examining the case, she determined it was down to a lack of care provision in the community and an unwillingness from the family to have her at home. Although, she said to me, almost smirking, she was quite pleased that Mabel hadn't died during the transfer, as such trips made the discharged planning team quite anxious. In order to deliver on the aims of end-of-life care, there have been several years of actual dedicated funding to develop new services and to sort of deliver choice on the ground. Now, despite the financial investment, the change is often sort of haphazard and disjointed, and I'm sure a lot of you are sort of aware of that. There's often a sort of a time delay between intention and change in practice. And even when it's there, it's difficult if not all services are sort of on the same page. For actually, you know, end-of-life care spans professional, industrial, and geographical boundaries. It didn't help in Mabel's case, of course, that there were several holidays which meant that cover was sort of less than optimal, to use the uh, business speak for it. What's striking, though, is that actually both Mabel and Norm lived and died within you know, 30 minutes of each other and had access to pa specialist palliative care. Both of them had specialist palliative care. But the personal impact of sort of this policy discourse was there had become an expectation that not only would they have access to this care, but that it would be in sort of their preferred place and on their terms. What's interesting 
is that the personal sense of failure that both the staff and family felt when Mabel was unable to go home and instead died in a care home. And over the eight weeks that she had been in hospital, is it really those three days that were in the care home didn't quite make up for her and her family that wish to sort of see her garden. Moreover, there's sort of an understanding that a large part of care within sort of policy discourse, that a large part of care um, should and will be provided by family and friends, these sort of informal carers as they're often referred to, who sort of help to hold the system together and have an active role in realizing deathbed wishes. So remember, Paul spent a lot of his time calling, trying to arrange carers. The good death picture that policy paints is one in which people are surrounded by family and friends, perhaps even dying at home in a hospital-grade bed. The real extent and cost, both financial and emotional, of this is seemingly unknown on an individual basis. Perhaps more importantly, though, it can be quite difficult to predict and prepare families for this complexity. I visited Norm's wife, Viola, a few months later. Now, she sits most days looking at his empty chair. During the last few days of his life, she said, nurses, and not just his specialist nurse, would come in <coughs> regularly, giving him some sort of thing for his pain. She said the occupational therapist brought in some equipment, helped adapt the bed. There was even mention of maybe bringing in a hospital bed. Now, Viola wasn't quite sure where the hospital bed would go. They had quite narrow rooms, and the rooms were quite cluttered with furniture they had collected over the years. It turned out they didn't need that hospital bed because everything was so smooth and so quick, she said. He'd only spent a few days in bed before he died. But she said quite softly, during that time, no one had really asked her how she was doing. And she realizes and wishes that they would have told her it would be so soon and that it would be so quick. Thinking back on all that activity, more nurses visiting, that thing for the pain, <coughs> clearly they knew he was dying and were trying to keep him well enough so that he could die in home as his preferred priority for care document outlined. Viola, although in the house during this time, felt like a witness and a shadow amongst all these visits. She said she'd open the door and then retreat into the kitchen as they would then go upstairs to the bedroom to tend to Norm. And she doesn't know why he wanted to stay at home. That's not something they ever really discussed. She said he was always treated really well in the hospital and they never had a bad experience. She said, confessing to me, that she was actually quite worried by his insistence to want to stay at home and that power of the document in the living room. She was unsure if she could cope. Now at first, I thought, okay, maybe she's unsure, you know, what will she do if he's dying and, and watching the symptoms as he dies. Um, but actually her fear and sense of obligation is probably best illustrated in an accident that they had late one night. Norm fell out of bed and Viola was very afraid. She wondered if she called the ambulance, would they take him into hospital? She told me she couldn't live with that guilt to be the reason he ended up there in the very place he said he didn't want to be. So, with her bad back, in the middle of the night, with no one to call on, she struggled to get him up. And she's still not sure how they ever managed that. She later learned from a friend after Norm's death that the ambulance can help with falls and not result in blue lights. But at the time, she says, she just didn't want to be the reason that he had to go to hospital if she couldn't cope. And she was then very sad that no one really had asked her what she had wanted through all of this. Now, in both Norm's and Mabel's cases, there's a sense that anticipating dying isn't quite clear. We know from research literature that it can be difficult to give prognos prognoses and uncertainty in sort of the anthropology and sociological literature uh, is sort of seen as a core element of medical practice. It's expected to be there. But the end-of-life care pathway, which outlines how to operationalize a lot of the policy around end-of-life care, relies on death as being something that can be foreseen, even if only abstractly. Although if you get to, sort of into the nitty-gritty in it, it actually relies on practical elements where being able to communicate and foresee death 
more clearly is needed. And much of what we had heard in sort of the media accounts and in the Neuburg report about the Liverpool care pathway in terms of families' responses to it is sort of the lack of communication around anticipating and foreseeing dying and making sense of the care professionals are seen to provide or not provide. <coughs> now, I'm not going to deny that communication can be better. And for both Norms and Mabel's families, they knew, actually, in some form or another, that dying was happening. And the professionals, when I interviewed them, said they had made it clear and thought that the families were very much aware of what was going on. That clarity, however, from the professional's point of view, is sort of in the implicit meaning of their actions, like moving someone to a side room, or upping the frequency of visits, or even providing different kinds of medications. And having plans in place, like the preferred priority for care documents, are sort of seen to represent to professionals working in this field a sort of an awareness and understanding on the parts of patients that their death is in the future and perhaps coming. But we might think about the use of these documents and noting the changes in these visits doesn't necessarily really tell us about the quality of that understanding or how people are making sense of these changes and what it impacts on them and their understanding of their self. Now, Norm's funeral uh, was described as beautiful and his obituary in the local paper was really short and simple, almost like his answers in the PPC. Dear husband, and much loved dad, died peacefully at home. That was it. And I noted on the side, as he wished. If she had known, Viola says she would have spent more time with him in those last few days, maybe laid in bed with him. But she no longer sensed a purpose now that he was gone and his chair was empty. It had been several months since he died when I last spoke to her. But when I spoke to her, she was just really questioning her coping. She had asked herself, sort of, are these recent heart problems a sign that I'm, I'm not coping very well? Or should I move to a granny annex so I all of a sudden have a purpose, someone to care for? She thought she intended to take up the bereavement support the hospice had offered. They had mentioned it shortly after Norm's death. But in the meantime, she spent most of her days in their living room, looking at his chair. She had his sympath the sympathy card stacked up on them and she read light fiction in order to escape. The hospice team viewed Norm's death as quite a success. Their ability for them to support him at home, relatively pain-free, and the services that had been offered to his wife, like bereavement care, were deemed relatively good. There was some comments internally about being able to use his case as an example to promote and extend the hospice at home services they were trying to um, provide business cases for. And they were saying that, like, you know, we, we were able to give Norm a good death, the one he wanted. We can then use this internally to convince more funding to come our way. The lead nurse also commented on how helpful it was that patients like Norm are so clear about their preferences. It helps the team, she said, really know what to do. But remember, you know, he was only really clear about place and didn't really elaborate it that much. Now, Mabel's funeral was several weeks after her death. And sort of like the discharge from hospital, there were lots of, of pieces in the puzzle to put together. It was a pleasant affair, actually. And her long-term Macmillan nurse even attended. There was no real comment about how Mabel died, and the focus was mainly on how she lived, what kind of a mother and grandmother she was, and overwhelmingly on how patient Mabel had been throughout her life. I spoke to Paul about six months after his mother's death to see how he was doing. He told me that there was initial frenzy to empty her house and to sell it, but it actually took quite a long time to return all those adaptive technologies. And now the house stood unsold, mostly empty, and the garden required frequent trips to keep it tidy and trying to show prospective sellers the home. He post-rationalized his attempt to clean the house quickly as a way of handling his grief, box it up, and move on. Yet, and he half laughed, said that this was impossible to do because there were still things to sort out from her death. 
the commode that sat there for ages, the boxes of bed pads that no one seemed to have wanted, and the long wait for her gravestone to be made. Perhaps it would be done by Christmas. He recalled uh, during our phone conversation the sort of catalog of problems, he said, that led to his mother being in the care home instead of in her home, despite all the be equipment being laid down. His voice during our conversation makes me realize I sort of triggered that frustration he felt back then. All I could do was push, he commented, but still saying there wasn't enough and that the system moved so slowly, even if it was only a matter of weeks. He felt that the hospital didn't want patients to stay. And here I'm going to quote, they just want the bed and to move them on. He felt a lot of it was just needing to move his mother out, and not necessarily because they wanted to provide her better care elsewhere. And he felt that the whole system was very uh, stop-start and doing all that he could do to do what he needed for his mother. But he conceded, or so it seemed, that he didn't want to fault the individual care provided by staff. It was just the system. Now looking back at it, he believed his mother decided to go when she found herself in the care home. He wondered if she had gone home, would she have lived longer and in a lifted mood? Now, though, he had said, he was trying to put it all behind him and move on. He felt he had regrets with how it was, but acknowledged that he did the best he could, even if the conclusion wasn't quite right. We ended our conversation with him saying how all of it, her dying and her death, were somehow still so alive. Perhaps it's not surprising that Paul and Viola feel uprooted and dislodged and upset after the deaths of Mabel and Norm. Grief can be many things for people. But today I want us to think <coughs> about how a particular focus on death and dying within end-of-life care might contribute to this and how it actually might change in the future if we keep you know, our current discourses around, that, around how people experience death and dying. Both families mentioned a sense of lack of support leading up to and after death, although not necessarily in practical support, but perhaps Mabel's case was wanting, but also in the emotional recognition of their own needs and experiences. Now, whilst there was care there for Norm and Mabel, what does care or what can care look like for those that are not dying, for the shadow and witness, as Viola referred to herself? And I don't want to suggest, actually, that the services that were, were somehow inadequate and unprofessional. So the hospice that Norm and Viola had access to and that were supporting him are actually quite a well-known hospice, really, really good at what they do, and they place a lot of value in looking after carers and providing holistic care. But I do want to suggest that by structuring end of life as something that can be managed through primarily medical care, the other elements of support an awareness of how people beyond the patient are experiencing this end can sometimes be marginalized. And at best, even when there is support, and we often know like sort of bereavement support does get marginalized within policy, it becomes instrumental and perhaps time limited. There's only a, a set number of visits someone might get. There are many elements about the wider death experience that are not covered or encapsulated in end-of-life care policy to date. There's no clear source of help to clean out Mabel's house, for example, or help for Viola to decide if she should move or find a new purpose and role other than wife. In anthropology, we talk about rites of passage as sort of having an ending in a transition back into society. There are things that help people move on and become this new role. The end-of-life care strategy, though, if we want to look at death as a rite of passage, sets out how to transition people into death, but not what should really happen after. We could argue perhaps it does this because it specifically seeks to be medically oriented, and by being medically oriented, it focuses primarily on the body, and that, well, once the body dies, that's more or less it. There is no after. But if we really want to push policy to be caring about dying, we should actually be by thinking about caring about death as well. I, I came here today to talk to you really about the personal impact of end-of-life care policy in England uh, on some people by sharing with two, two examples, Mabel and Norm. Now, we often measure on a much more grand societal level the impact of policy through metrics 
or through surveys on patient and care satisfaction. And we hope that a lot of times these sort of numbers go up. Now, on paper, both Norm and Mabel could be actually said to have some relatively good deaths. They were at home, as care homes can be classed home, or at least they weren't in hospital. Their pain was relatively well controlled, family were present for both deaths, and even for Norm, he was able to die, die in his preferred, prior, preferred place. But neither Viola or Paul wanted to fault the care given to their family, but they, neither of them also felt comfortable as satisfied is not quite the right word here, and they never really used the word satisfied, with how the deaths had been. The personal impact then mixes this good with the frustration, loneliness, and uncertainty. As anthropologists, we often talk about policy as creating new subjectivities. Who a person is, what they can know, what they can experience. I'd argue that through this research, we can see that end-of-life care patients are being structured to be seen as people who can and want to make choices about their treatment and care and where they die within the remits of current medical practice. In some ways or another, they're expected to be present, particularly at the deathbed, and to provide some sort of care. And yet families and patients also expect the system to work and to be smooth, to deliver on the promises of choice. There's lots of absences in these stories, and I can't cover them. But we can probably probe ourselves to go, actually, how might we think about death and dying in something other than a medical lens? Both of these people had cancer. What would it have been like if they had other conditions? Both of these examples had professionals who were involved working hard as possible to deliver best practice within the resources that they had. I guess today I want to ask you if the sense of disappointment that we might hear in Paul and Viola's accounts is because there's a failing in the system, or perhaps unclear communicators within it, or perhaps can we question how end-of-life care is being portrayed as something that can and should always go well and result in a good for everyone. And that this portrayal, whilst ambitious and noble, may not quite really meet up to the everyday experiences of those delivering and receiving the care that interprets these ideals.